do you think on this day, this Armistice Day, how do you feel about the way that we treat veterans in this country and our priorities as a nation? Oh, hi, Patrick. Thanks for inviting me on the show. Let me say, just to begin with, you know, I went to uh, fight in operations and in uh, peacekeeping conflicts to actually give these people the freedoms and the values that we do get in the West. And I have a great amount of empathy and first-hand experience to what they've actually seen and been through. But the problem we're now facing is um, is they, they seem um, determined to come to these shores. And it seems to be at the cost of some of my community. You know, I have veterans that um, we have to feed daily, that have not been housed, that have been struggling since they've come out due to mental health, due to injury, due to addiction, that would quite uh, frankly love to be put into a holiday inn and fed three times a day. And I am starting to question that are we getting the order of priority wrong in this instance? And if we're not looking after the very, very people that gave us these freedoms and rights that we have in this country as a priority, that we are going wrong. And we're really sending a negative uh, message to the veteran community that I serve. Lieutenant General Jonathan Riley, I'll bring you in now. Can you understand a growing sense of public dissatisfaction, maybe, when it comes to our nation's priorities? Yeah, well, it's uh, taken long enough, hasn't it? Uh, it's been a source of uh, uh, extreme uh, irritation, uh, making me angry for many years. And to, to go back to your question about uh, what the veterans of the two world wars might have thought. Well, my father fought in the Second World War, both my grandfathers in the First World War, and I know what they would have told you because I heard them say it, and they would have said it wasn't for this. It really wasn't. Uh, and more recently, uh, we, uh, uh, we fought wars and, and campaigns. Our servicemen and women gave their lives and limbs uh, to make overseas countries better places. Uh, and they didn't do that so that the inhabitants could run away and come here. Uh, they did it so the inhabitants could make something of those countries, and that's what they should be doing. Uh, and uh, the fact that they're being allowed to come here uh, uh, speaks to both what uh, both of you just talked about, uh, which is the prioritization, uh, prioritization of those people who are coming here uh, as against those who uh, serve their country. And there are two big issues for me, which, and I'll pause before I w w go into them. Uh, one is homelessness, uh, often the result of mental health. And the other is the prosecution of veterans, particularly in Northern Ireland. That's a good one that I missed off my list. I will come back to you on both of those. Gary, I'll bring you back in now. Now, Gary, you do a lot of work, a huge amount of work. You're on call, really, when it comes to helping get veterans off the streets. But there is supposed to be something in place, and this comes back to our priorities, doesn't it? There's supposed to be this armed forces covenant, the military covenant, which, as I understand it, Gary, is designed to help give veterans priority housing and mental health care. Oh, no, we've lost Gary. OK, I'll just come back to you then, Jonathan, sorry. Just, just, on, just on what you were saying there, actually, about the historic prosecution, actually, of some of our veterans. That's another way, isn't it, in which we let our veterans down? Well, indeed, it seems all right for Blair to have given carte blanche to convicted murderers uh, to roam around the streets, do what they like, uh, without any fear of prosecution. Uh, but uh, if you are a veteran uh, involved in some incident, maybe 30, 40 years ago that you can barely remember, uh, then uh, you're up for interview by the police. And if you say the wrong thing, uh, before you know it, uh, you'll find yourself in court. Mm. And we've just heard that uh, his, the pr prosecutions are about to recommence. Uh, mm. Based on what happened uh, last time, uh, with cases being chucked out, I, yeah. I wonder how far they'll get. But the fact is, should this be happening at all? No, it's, uh, well, it's no, it, it fair. shouldn't. Um, it shouldn't. It's, know, it's not fair that someone... Especially propaganda. Propaganda especially someone who, for example, maybe this was years ago, decades ago, gets a knock on the door one day, you know, what were you doing on this specific date at this specific time, this specific incident? I've spoken to a few people. In fact, Dennis Hutchins was one of them. Unfortunately, he's passed away now. Passed away, as I understand it, in a hospital bed in Northern Ireland with no family around him as a result of the fact that he was being dragged back yet again for another ridiculous trial. But, mm. Gary, you are back now. Sorry, we lost you there for a second. Talk to me about... 
maybe the ways that our, that our armed forces covenant, our military covenant, is letting down veterans, because it is supposed to be giving them priority, isn't it? And actually, it's pretty clearly not in some cases. Yes, so I actually left the forces in 2010 and sadly couldn't return to my own borough uh, where I lived because it was pre-Armed Forces Covenant. Then the Armed, Force Co Armed Forces Covenant was brought in to protect us, but it is still very, very wishy-washy. I have run in battles with housing directors across many different counties across the country that are interpreting the Armed Forces Covenant to what they think, and there is no actual solid hardline rules to what is acceptable mm. and what isn't. Only recently I had a serving soldier come to me in a desperate state that was getting out in two months and was already living in an unmodified transit. That young soldier served 12 years and multiple um, conflicts and operations. Mm. And the best we could offer him uh, was the back of a transit in his father's garden. It's shocking and it's not right. I'm lucky to live in Portsmouth City, and they are a shining example of actually how the Armed Forces Covenant should be adhered to. Portsmouth City is six square miles and has a population of 22,000 22, veterans by itself. And it has very limited housing stock and space. But if they are looking after the, the communities most vulnerable and they are leading the way uh, in housing them, whether it be in projects, whether it yeah. be in permanent housing or whether, whether it be in services like mine, mm. why cannot other cities in exactly. the country that have much more amenities, much more space, also not do the same? It's not all negative. I was uh, privy to overhearing a conversation in my community recently where they were actually discussing getting in dinghies and going out into the Solent, throwing their passports into the Solent and coming back and saying, now do we get the same justice? Now do we get the same service as everybody else? Yeah, it's shocking. We do need to help immigrants. We yeah. do. But we are being taken advantage of, and that is very, very clear.